Welcome to Question Time on tonight's panel. David Davis, former Brexit secretary under Theresa May, leading light of the Leave campaign during the EU referendum and former chairman of the Conservative Party, currently making his voice heard from the backbenches. Mayor of Greater Manchester, previously Labour Health Secretary under Gordon Brown during the swine flu crisis and a thorn in the side of the government at key moments during the Covid pandemic, Andy Burnham. Chica Russell, financier turned entrepreneur. In 2015, she had offers from all five dragons on the BBC's Dragon's Den, but went on to establish Chica Foods, a range of African-inspired snacks on her own terms. Joining us down the line, Madeline Grant, parliamentary sketch writer at The Telegraph and columnist for The Sunday Telegraph. and. Renee Renowned poet, musician, actor, activist, and self-described naughty boy, whatever that might mean, Benjamin Zephaniah. Good evening, welcome to my guests here in the studio. Madeline, very good to see you down the line. Thank you for joining us. And of course to our QT50 audience, very good to see you again. Depending on how this pandemic goes, it might be for the last time, but very good to see you. And thank you very much to you at home for joining us and for watching. And if you want to join in the conversation, you can in the usual way, of course, at BBC Question Time on social media. Right, we'll take our first question now, which is Becky, Becky Pierce. Thank you, Fiona. Welcome, panel. Um, so was Boris's non-action uh, non against Matt Hancock yet another missed opportunity to show decent leadership and set the standard for social distancing? David. No, I don't think so. Um, I, with all these things, when, when somebody falls from grace, there's always a, almost a lynch mob in the press. And I think, and I watched this, and I thought it was pretty plain that Matt was going to go. But Boris, I think, made a number of decisions. Now, I'm just reading his mind the same way you would. Um, I, I don't know what he thought. Firstly, he's a... We know a what he said. Which is we know what he said. He said yeah, no. Apology and considered the matter closed. Yeah, we know what he said. But you know, he's, a, he's an ex-journalist. He knows that not all journalists are sort of saintly pursuers after truth. They're more pursuers of headlines. Um, he also knows that he's talking about replacing his most important cabinet member, really, at this point in, in the middle of this crisis. He knows he's also talking about the fate of two families and six children and so on. So I suspect what he did, what he was doing, was creating time and for, for uh, the... Uh, for Matt Hancock to uh, make his own decision. That's what I suspect was going on. I don't know, but that's what I suspect. And frankly, you know, if a prime minister shows some loyalty, even perhaps unwise loyalty to a subordinate, I think that's a good thing too. So I think I would have done the same thing, frankly, in those circumstances. But let's be, let's be clear. The right outcome happened. Uh, Hancock went, he had to go. What he'd done was wrong. What he'd done was horrible for all the people who'd had to live through the traumatic circumstances of small funerals and, and weddings, they, seeing, the, seeing their close relatives die without being able to say goodbye, that sort of thing. They will all have felt really, really angry. So he couldn't stay. But I think, I don't think Boris should have done much different. Well, interesting. Mm. A whole array of hands shot up as you were talking. <laughs> I will come to you in a minute. So you're saying, David, you would have done the same thing, Andy? Well, I don't agree with David on this. Uh, I would answer you, Becky, by saying I do think so. You need a Prime Minister to lead from the front at any time, but particularly during a pandemic when extraordinary things are being asked of people, when families are not seeing loved ones who are dying in hospital. That is exactly the moment that the Prime Minister needs to set the standards that the country has to live by. Otherwise, it all falls apart, and I think that's where we're kind of getting to. This idea of one rule for them, one rule for everyone else, was kind of introduced by the, the handling of the uh, Dominic Cummings trip to Barnard Castle, but it's just been reinforced now by, by the way uh, the last few days uh, have played out. And I get the increasing sort of impression that it's impossible to get sacked from this government. You know, you can breach the ministerial code, you can give contracts to your friends, you know, what, what would it take, actually, to get sacked uh, well, from Well, one this minister government? has been sacked, which is Johnny Mercer. Uh, this is the only minister who's been sacked since the 2020 reshuffle. He disagreed with government policy on historic prosecutions of Northern Ireland veterans. He's the only one. Well, that's my point, and, and I don't think the Prime Minister is setting the right standards. Uh, and it's particularly important at a time, a time like, like this. Uh, to also just sort of dismiss 
the kind of feelings that uh, Keir Starmer kind of brought over in the Commons at Prime Minister's Question Time that many families will have had who've not been able to see loved ones, to dismiss it as kind of concerns of the Westminster bubble, I think it really showed he's kind of, he's not thinking this through properly. And I would say that they, they need to really change how there is a sense of standards being applied to, to this government and consistency. And we had another thing this week that top business executives could, could escape quarantine. I mean, it's just this thing that some people are, are living by some rules, other people are being asked to live by other rules. The danger of that is it all, all the discipline collapses just when we still need to remain vigilant. It's interesting because we're almost a week on from this and I wondered how many questions would come in on this. I suspected perhaps not that many. We had loads and lots of hands are up now. So let's hear from some of you. Jo. I think that it, this is a, a clear example of how there are huge double standards and disparities. Um, this was one opportunity for Boris Johnson to stand up and be counted, actually show us that he does have a moral compass and that he takes um, that sort of behaviour very seriously. There is a litany of poor behaviour, poor standards in public office uh, to which he doesn't address. And in particular, at the moment, with the acceleration of the vaccine programme, which they keep referring to as a huge success, which it is, I think that's a distraction from what's going on. And I don't, I don't understand how the government feel that people will follow the rules now when they have a health secretary or ex-health ex secretary that clearly can't and won't follow the rules. OK, Jack. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm in total agreement with people who find it absurd that we have to wait for a Tory minister to actually do the honourable thing and resign. Uh, it's yet another example that Boris Johnson either has no conception of moral standards in public office or simply doesn't actually have the power to sack the people uh, who aren't performing or who are ridden by scandals. And I'm not sure which is more concerned. Rose? Yeah, I think, I don't say this often, but I think David hit the nail on the head there that Boris is treating this as an, as an old boys club and it's not an old boys club, it's leading a nation and you put the people first. And that's not at all what has happened here. It's the tip of the iceberg for me. I don't, I don't hugely care about this affair story. What I care about is him giving contracts to people who haven't gone through proper channels, giving jobs to friends and just treating the public with blatant disregard and for me he should have been sacked the second the story came out so benjamin just listening to what people are saying i mean joe's put the point that a number of people have put since this all broke which is why should we follow the rules when we've seen those in highest office not doing so i think David Davis here said something really, really important just a moment ago. He said Boris Johnson was a journalist. And I think the problem is he thinks he can still act like a journalist. He's a politician who's leading the country. So he really has to lead by example. And during this whole last year and five, six months or whatever it is, I've come across many, time, many um, occasions when um, people are breaking the rules. And when they're breaking the rules, they're saying, well, you know, they're referring to Dominic Cummings and all these kind of things. And I don't think politicians are anybody special, but people do look to them for leadership. And right now, it's not a normal time. It's not an ordinary time. We really need leadership. And if Boris Johnson or, or any other politician feels that they, they, they can't act like a journalist or act like a businessman or something like that, no, we need political leadership because I, it's very difficult for me to start speaking about these things without being emotional. COVID-19 has really affected my family and my friends. And when we wanted to come together, we couldn't. You know, my sister buried people. That was her job. Yeah. And then she got the virus. So we have to do it. Even we, when we came here tonight, a question time panel, we were careful. We're all trying to be careful. Mm -hmm. If we have the, the rulers of our country and their friends not being careful, not being good examples, then what hope have we got for the rest of people? Yeah. Mm. Madeline? Well, just a word in defence of journalists. If, um, if I was in charge, I would have sacked Matt Hancock on the spot too. Um, I think that the position was clearly untenable, given his 
pivotal role, as we've heard from so many of our participants tonight, um, in not just creating these draconian and inhumane rules that we've all had to live by, um, but in often actually going further and taking an even harsher line than many of his colleagues. The position was clearly untenable, and I think that the delay does reflect very poorly on the PM. Um, but it also brings in real questions, I think, not just about public trust, which has been, um, you know, seriously damaged by this and many other things, but I think about the level of compliance. Um, I think when you get to this level of disparity and complete double standards and hypocrisy, there are now enough exemptions, often quite ridiculous ones, that you just think, well, this government has forfeited the right to expect widespread adherence to the rules that still exist. I mean, it's not just Matt Hancock, which was outrageous enough. Um, but there are these extraordinary inconsistencies about what's allowed. You know, when you see um, crowds of the size that we saw at Wembley, exemptions for the UA for VIPs, exemptions for business travellers, um, and you see politicians breaking the rules so flagrantly, um, but it's still difficult for people who are trying to organise weddings, who are trying to visit sick relatives, and it's still very, very difficult for kids in schools because the same testing re regime remains in place and people are still having to isolate in huge numbers and it's still incredibly chaotic. Um, expecting this kind of endless one will for them, another for us, after a while that really starts to grate on people and I think what we need is a return to some kind of normality and we need to rearrange our priorities in all sorts of ways. Tony. Thank you Fiona, thank you panel. I think David Davis put it quite succinctly, I mean Matt Hancock clearly made a big mistake. Uh, the next day he lost his job. It's quite possibly lost his family as well. Uh, that's a horrible thing to happen to anybody. And uh, I think we should be very careful about throwing stones at people because uh, I'm sure that we've all made mistakes, all done things that we regret in the past. What I'd like to know is if this happened on the 6th of May, why did it take the whistleblower something like seven weeks to put the story into a tabloid newspaper? Why did he wait so long to actually put it into a paper when, when he could have done it, perhaps done something almost immediately. Uh, and, and this incident would have been closed something like two months ago. Well, of course, we've no idea, A, who blew the whistle, and B, when they obtained that footage. We don't know. It could have been a delay. I mean, that could answer that question. All that is, is the great unknown, I'm afraid. Becky, you asked, you asked this question. I did, yes. And just to come back on that, this isn't about the whistleblower. This is about Matt Hancock, and this is about leadership, and this is about Boris Johnson being incapable of holding his party to account. I agree with what Andy Burnham just said in that, what is it, do you, is it that you have to do to be sacked for action to be taken? And I think in terms of um, Dave Dave's comments around, there's nothing you would have done differently. Well, there's clear gaslighting going on by Boris here. The matter is closed one minute, and then he took decisive action the next. Well, it can't really be both, can it? So I think it's it's about um, you know when you are stood on a plinth asking the public to do something, but you are ill prepared to do it. You have to go, as you've pointed out yourself. It's inevitable that this person needed to go, and yet Boris Johnson took no action. And so again, I agree with the audience. Complete in inconsistencies here. Real lack of leadership. Really poor. Chica. I mean, um, I completely understand. Um, you know where. Um, David's coming from in that the Prime Minister was trying to buy time. However, of course, I mean, he is the leader of our nation and all of us are super, super, super tired business owners, the public just, you know, of this pandemic. And I agree with all of the panel at home um, in that I agree with, you know, Andy and Benjamin. We need accountability. We need consistency. We need clarity. And, you know, for myself as a business leader, my team look to me for direction and you know this you know you know as joe said he said the case is closed one moment and then a few days later it was actually we you know we fired him matt took a role he accepted the job to be a public figure and that comes with many benefits as he has so happily used those benefits you know but he is he is a leader and arguably the most one of the most watched men you know on um on our screens and to have been given the opportunity to resign was a luxury i think i mean you know um if he had been working for an organization and the government is an organization 
he would have been marched off immediately before he had a chance to pack his bags. Right, well. You know, and the blatant infidelity, the, I mean, the cheek, you know, and I think, yes, you know, Tony, as you mentioned, he has a family, there are six children involved, but he didn't think about that, did he? He didn't. He, you know, as a leader, he should have thought about that first and then um, put that first before he, you know, behaved how he had behaved. And I think, you know, with all of the rules put in place, which we're all having to abide by, and as Benjamin mentioned, you know, family members who can't come together, weddings being postponed, and, you know, um, I just buried my father-in-law, and we were limited by numbers. You know, the social distancing that we've all had to abide by. And here is this guy just having a good old jolly. It's not acceptable, is it? So, David, let me, let me come back to you, because you've had a lot of people, not all, but most that we've spoken so, so yeah, taking issue with you. And, and part of the question from Becky was, was Boris's non-action a missed opportunity to set the standard for social distancing? And there's been a bit of comeback of the picture of, of the Prime Minister seen celebrating England's goal on Tuesday. Everyone was standing around, some with drinks in their hands. But the guidance for outdoor events says everyone must be seated if they're consuming food and drink. And there have been a few people who were organising weddings saying, we can't do that. Why is he doing it? Mm. How is, what do you make of that? Oh, no, I, I think the, 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 almost the worst example of that was G7, where there was a picture of them all clearly staged, separated as we are, uh, and then afterwards somebody took a snap and they were all together. And so why should anyone listen to what the politicians are saying? Well, I, what the I, I, look, saying I mean, I agree with the fact that you've got to provide leadership by your action as well as by what you say. I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, as, as many of you may know, I mean, I've been fighting against this ex some of the excessive uh, limitations about this. But, you know, I don't, I don't disagree. That's why Hancock had to go. You know, Hancock had to go because, I mean, all of us virtually on this, on this panel, by the sounds of it, and, and uh, up and down the country have had funerals, weddings, okay. cool. other episodes to, 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 to deal with, yeah. which we have But you wouldn't have sat in, that's the point, as you say, you wouldn't have sat in. Just very quickly before yeah, I get to Well, question. I just think it's not a political point, it's just a broader point, given where we are. I just think we're at quite a potentially quite risky moment in, in the pandemic. And I'll pick up something Madeline said. There's a growing sense of inconsistency here in terms of how rules are being applied. So I'll give you an example. You know, we've got parents complaining that they can't go to school sports days and they see Wimbledon absolutely packed out. Mm. Or yeah. in our case, you have the Scottish government, so it's not all the UK government, Scottish government out of nowhere hitting Manchester and Salford with a travel ban at the same time as thousands and thousands of people were leaving Scotland to go to London mm. for the football. And I think the danger is that governments are behaving inconsistently now. And if they carry on in that way, we're going to see people just beginning to say, well, we are, you know, we're just not, we're not putting up with this. Well, and that is a dangerous okay. thing to happen honest, at this honest, stage. Andy, I think they already are. I think they already are. I mean, the, the well, after, some after, might be, but an awful lot of our audience no, quite no, clearly but, are but, obeying but, the rules. Uh, but you know, if, you, if you walked up uh, a street in London uh, after the uh, match, there were lots of pubs full of people um, in breaking all the rules you're talking about. Now, that's already happening, I'm afraid. And you're right. Part of it is because of the complexity and inconsistency of the rules. Yep. We agree on that. And part of it is because the, the leaders are not showing, they were showing right. the way. Let's take uh, another question. But before we want to do, we do that, I just want to say this is our last programme for the summer. We're taking a break over the summer. And when we come back, we plan to be on the road again, COVID permitting. Uh, so we will have our audiences right here with us. We very much hope so. Can't be sure, but that's what we're aiming for. So, uh, if you live in Croydon, it's such a long time since I've said this. If you live in Croydon, <laughs> in South London, please come and join us on the 16th of September. I know it seems like ages away, but we'd love to hear from you well before then. 16th of September, and the week after, the 23rd, we will be in Cambridge, as I say. We'll be in Cambridge. So do go to the Question Time website, follow the instructions there, and who knows, you might be able to come and have your say. I fervently hope so. Right. Let's take another question now from Stephanie, Stephanie Pitts. Hi, good evening. The new health secretary, Shadid Javid, um, says we need to learn to live with the virus. What does that mean and how will society look when we, um, without restrictions? See, so, yeah, there's me talking about what September will look like. I mean, Benjamin, what's, what's, your, what's your view? The Prime Minister's already said today that we may have some restrictions in place even after July the 19th. We don't know what they will be. 
how do you see life after COVID or living with COVID? It looks, looks very depressing and <laughs> I'm kind of half laughing because I don't know why every time I come on this program, I bring up the subject of veganism. <laughs> now, I'm not going to rub it down <laughs> your throat, but these viruses come from animals. And, you know, the evidence shows the more we cut down rainforests, the more we're going to come into contact with animals that don't want to come into contact with us. The animals are no better. They, st they stay in the rainforest. We cut down the forest and we encounter them. And coronaviruses will keep jumping from them to us. And I think COVID-19 is one thing, but I think there's a lot more to come. And we are going to have to deal with it. It's the consequences of our actions, you know? And I'd, I heard today that it's from a study in um, the University of Utrecht that human beings are now giving COVID-19 to their pets, to their, to their cats, cats and, dogs. and dogs. Now imagine if it mutates again and then comes back to us. I mean, this is really scary. I mean, it, it, it's talking about very small numbers and they're not getting particularly ill. I mean, it's just they're not worth getting saying particularly that. ill. But, but, but yes, but there, there is some evidence that they're, they're But lots of viruses, it, yeah. when they start off, they're not particularly bad and they get worse and worse and worse. We have to change our relationship with the environment, with animals, very quickly if we are going to live in a world where we'll never live in a world that's free of viruses but living a world where we can meet where we can hug where we can party all these very simple things that we take for granted you know and do you think you'll you'll be happy to do those things after july the 19th do you think you'll go from you know like you arrived today with your mask and after july the 19th can you see yourself feeling comfortable just living life as you did before, or do you think it's going I'm to be really different? I'm really nervous, and I have a gig on July the 19th, right? And then I have my band booked for, talk, for, for concerts in the summer, and I'm very nervous about it. In fact, when it started, I remember they were talking about black men of a certain age, you were very vulnerable, and that was me. Yeah. And I was doing shows with young white teenagers, and I think they're spitting their poetry over me. I mean, this is, like, very, very dangerous. Now, we've passed that, and we've had various mutations, but... I'm still worried about what's going to happen in the future. When I hear you talk about coming back in September, I kind of think, yeah? Well, so what, do <laughs> what do we know? Yeah, well, no, I feel the same. So I don't know. We've, we've always had to live with viruses. Ever since we started getting the liquids and the saliva and the blood of animals on us. Right? Mm. And if you're going to keep doing that, you've got to be prepared to live with a lot more viruses. I'd rather not. I'd rather the world go vegan and we just start making love again. But. Well, I don't is. know about the first, but certainly the second. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, David, you've obviously been very critical of, of the quantity of restrictions we've had to yeah. live under. The Prime Minister signalled today that some of those restrictions may continue after July 19th. Who knows how long for? What do you think it's going to look like, our summer, our autumn, going into winter? It, what, what, it depends first and foremost on what happens with the disease, obviously. Of course. Um, that's self-evident. Well, of course, that's an unknown. But given what well, we know at present... No, it's not entirely an unknown. I mean, we, we, we can see the trajectory now. I mean, people keep talking about breaking the link between the cases and the hospitalizations and the fatalities. It's not a broken link, it's a dramatically suppressed link. That's what's going on. And that's working because of the vaccines. The therapies are improving as well. Uh, and the aim is to get this to a point where it's, it's never going to be non-fatal, but where it's less than flu, if you like. Flu kills between 20, five and 25,000 people a year. And we don't lock down because of flu. Uh, and so that's the sort of first thing. Now, assuming we can get there, I want to see us go back as close to the freedoms we had before as we possibly can. I mean, I, one of the things I'm going to be doing come July 19th is saying, OK, what's left over from a year of, of ministerial decisions, which is talking minister, not parliamentary decisions, ministerial decisions on a vast range of subjects where we've given up our freedoms. Mm. And I, that's what I want. I want to see us get back as close as we can to usual. In the middle of all that, you know, we're going to be having government making plans to deal with future pandemics, as, uh, as Benjamin uh, refers to. Andrew, <coughs> Andy will have been a part of some of those plans already, I suspect, in terms of future preparations. But we've got to get back to our country running as normal. That's what the public want, I think. Okay. That's what we ought to be deliver. So, Amanda, you're shaking your head at that. Why is that? I don't personally have the, com um, the confidence to actually walk out in the street um, 
without a mask on. I was on holiday last week. I was lucky enough to get away to, um, to Cornwall. And Cornwall, a lot of it, is in lockdown because of the G7. Um, and the, the proximity of so many people, it's, it's, um, I just don't have the confidence that somebody's not going to sne sneeze on me or cough on me. Um, and I think that I, it's going to be a long, long time before I will actually take my mask off wherever I go. OK, I mean, there's suggestions that the, the rise in case in Cornwall was perhaps due to half term prior to the G7. I'm not, I'm not sure it's quite as clear cut as that, but I hear what you say. Andrea. Thanks, Fiona. You know, I think the only way we can go now is forward. We can't go back. We cannot go into another lockdown situation. We must come out of this. And of course, we've been coming out of it gradually. And that's the right way to go. But, you know, if we look at the, the pictures we've all seen of people watching the football, I hate to go back to the football all the time, but the, the, the seating outside was socially distanced for a reason. And then when you see the pictures of everybody watching the match, everybody's up on their feet, everybody's hugging. Um, and yes, we have to go forward, but we still must be careful. There may be less people in hospital with COVID these days. However, there are still people suffering from long COVID, which is a really serious illness. Uh, we don't know the impact on people's bodies that, it, that it's taken yet. So we still have to be very careful when we're coming out of this. And we all have to work together to make sure the only direction that we go is forward. Nicola? Um, I just, I just really hope that um, the new normal in education goes back to, you know, schools being being back to normal. We're seeing another surge of, you know, lots of children isolating at the moment, and and I think I hope, and that's a real priority for the government to get our children back to school as much as they can. As difficult as it is as we cope with the pandemic, I think our young children already have, you know, this legacy to deal with, and I just really hope that that's a priority that we can get schools back to as normal as, as possible in September. So, Chica, what do you think society is going to look like without restrictions, or will there still be some restrictions as we go forward? What would you like to see happen? Oh, I mean, I think that we um, need to maintain some restrictions because we, you know, we cannot afford to go back. And um, I think that... So what kind of things are you thinking? Would you, you be know, happy for masks, mask wearing to continue, for example? Masks, for instance, are a very small imposition. Um, and I think we should remain, you know, wearing masks. I what think about schools? Because schools, obviously, there's yeah. you know, one in 20 are off school at the moment, uh, certainly in England, at least, because of COVID. And, and I think that's the fundamental, that's the reason why we really need to maintain some of the restrictions, because the schools and the children have suffered, you know, so much and, and continue, you know, to suffer. And, the, you know, we speak about this, this disparity, and there is huge disparity between, you know, children who are you know, from kind of less privileged socioeconomic backgrounds who have missed a year plus of education. And, you know, and if we are going to be living with this new norm, and of course, you know, as David mentioned, the app, at some point eventually, we hopefully will go back, you know, to, you know, a, a more normal norm where we, are, you know, it's a bit like living with the flu and there aren't as many deaths and there are no more school closures. But I think that we have to be on the front foot because we don't know what's coming. You know, we, we know to expect the unexpected and we do know that at some point something's going to crop up again. And I think what the government must, must make sure of is that the way this education system was dealt with has to be really addressed properly. It has to be looked at and make a plan that actually this is going to come back at some point, maybe not in 2022, it could come back in 2023. And you look at the children, you know, who um, did homeschooling and, you know, some of them had 60 minutes a day of, mm. of, you know, Zoom classes, 60 minutes. And if we are saying that, and I mean, my view is that it was not handled very well at all, but, you know, you, can, you could say nobody knew it was coming and so we were, you know, the government were on the back foot. But now that we know that, you know, a very, you know, a virus of some sort does come come up every so often. We have to make a firm plan of these children in state schools from these low socioeconomic backgrounds who have parents that don't speak the language, who have parents that work full time. You know, the the mental health on children, the impact on, you know, 
some of them are uh, you know, three, four months behind of where they should be. Um, what can we do to ensure that when we do go back into a lockdown and we know with the rising okay, variant... Well, it, where, if we do, I mean, who knows if we will go back into a lockdown. Obviously, uh, some people think we will, some yeah, think yeah. maybe not. I mean, so, Andy, what, mm. what does it mean to live with the virus? What will society look like? I, mean, I um, want to start by saying that I like uh, Sajid. Uh, Javid. Um, well, I'm sure he'll be delighted the, to hear yeah, that. Yeah, and there's always a but, though, <laughs> yes, isn't there? Yes, uh, uh, I'm but, sure he'll be delighted with your endorsement. But in the last week, in his first week as health secretary, he has sounded more like the Chancellor of the Exchequer than health secretary, in that he seems to be more concerned with the economy. And, and I think uh, he just needs to be a little careful about that. And I say that in supporting the easing, as some, some of the a uh, panel have, have said, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying restrictions is the right way to go. I think we do need to move more to advice and let people kind of manage their, their way through this and, and, and trust people uh, to do that. But I am worried, and I agree with Chica about this, I am worried about reports that distancing is going to be dropped and masks are going to be dropped. Now, I don't know if David was advocating well, both of those Any distance that you'd like to keep all the distancing measures that well, are in place at the moment? you've got to keep one or the other. I think you can't kind of get rid of distancing and the, the, the requirement to wear masks. I think you at least have to keep one of those. Because I was listening carefully to Amanda. You know, you've got to think about people who will feel, you know, worried about being out there with people without masks. If I take the, the tram in Manchester, you know, I know that if, if that, that goes, some people will feel very vulnerable if they were to use, uh, to use the tram. And I think it's better to keep, I would say, the masks uh, requirement. So even um, if, if deaths continue, I mean, they are rising, but very slowly, if deaths continue at the... I mean, no-one wants any deaths, but if they continue at the relatively low level they are, you would want to keep either face masks or social distancing. Well, I think I'm right in saying that cases were highest today than they've been since January. Yes, infections, yes. Yeah, and that's a worry. But you are also right to say, Fiona, that it isn't translating into hospitalisation. I was discussing the figures in Manchester with David just before the show. You know, a, a, a creeping up. So the, 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 there is a break between cases and hospital, hospitalisation, definitely. But I think the general point is, if you... If you get to the middle of July and say, OK, there's no masks, there's no distancing, the message coming out from the government will be we are back to normal. But I don't think we are back to normal. I think it is a case of living with this thing, I think, as Benjamin was, was saying. And for me, masks are a physical barrier to the spread of the virus, but they're also a reminder to everybody that we're still not living in normal times and we all need to look out for each other. We still need to keep a bit of distance from each other. I just think that is a sensible way to go. Is that how you'd like to see it go, Madeleine? No, I, I don't think so. I, I, I want the old normal back. I, I don't want to live in a kind of... I don't want us to turn into China. I don't want to live in a surveillance state. I think that masks... I, I agree with Chica that they're a smaller imposition than many. And it, they may be needed for a while longer. But I also don't want to accept a future of indefinite mask wearing. I think perhaps if we're going to live with this in the way that we live with flu, that would mean things like widespread inoculation, keep giving people booster jabs, people who are symptomatic should be encouraged, obviously, to stay away from schools and workplaces, yes. But I think that a few things do need to change if it's if we're to regain a sense of normality and not fall into the kind of pessimism that I think many of us are feeling, uh, both fear of going outside and doing things, but also a pessimism about whether life's ever going to return to normal. Um, we've got so horribly used to that sensation of the, the goalposts moving, and they've moved so many times that they're now, you know, we're playing rugby against the uh, the, near, the neighbouring rugby club now, not football anymore. It's, it's, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, I think is the feeling. Um, but to regain that sense of normality, I think we also need to perhaps... Um, we need to scrap this obsession with testing kids in schools, or at least we need to devise a better system for dealing with children in schools, because right now um, there's, you know, entire year groups in classrooms and uh, are being sent home when one pupil tests positive. That is clearly not sustainable. Um, and I also think perhaps the reporting needs to change, because right now people are often being read out figures that sound scary in and of themselves. You know, you hear of, of a number of deaths per day or the number of, of, of infections. Um, but without the true context and without, for example, knowing where those infections are taking place, if they're taking place amongst people who are at very minimal risk of serious infection or complications, then that is a very difficult proposition. But without that context, I think it adds to that sense of pessimism and fear. And I think until we get past that, 
um, I don't think that we're going to be in the, the old normal again, which is ultimately, I think, what we should all hope for. Just if I could say, though, Madeline, the trouble with what you're saying, it's, it's Andy here, the trouble with what you're saying is you're kind of assuming that there's going to be no variant that challenges the vaccine, but, you know, Benjamin was saying before, there could be. So the point about saying yeah. it's got to be irreversible, I think you, you might find yourself in a really difficult place with public opinion if you assert that, and then all of a sudden a variant appears that can, can break through the vaccine. So what, what do you do then and how do you get the public to buy back in? But Andy, one, well, one of the things would... that will have changed after this is the public being more cautious. In the old days, we, you know, we couldn't get people to take flu uh, uh, vaccinations. Now you're going to see a lot more of that. The government's current plan on a third vaccination is going to help reduce the risk of the variant, a new variant bypassing it and so on. I think the in the future we're going to see every September huge vaccination mm. programmes and that will enable us to go back to normal. That's, that's what that was the plan must be. Let me just, let, I'll come back to you, but Madeline, you wanted to come back in. I just wanted to say, I, I, I agree with that point, I, but I also, with variants, I think sometimes there's been a tendency to get completely panicked about a new variant without the necessarily the grounds for doing so. I, I think we should deal with the risk that we actually currently face, not the possible nebulous risk, which I agree is very scary, of a new variant coming in that is resistant to all the vaccines. Um, until we have firm evidence of that, um, you know, I think we need to work with the world as we currently have it and not on some eventuality that, that you know, for which there is no proof as, as yet. Benjamin. I may have sounded really heavy when I was talking about the evolution of <laughs> veganism and the, the way we touched animals and all that not stuff earlier. But, you know, let me just put it like this. I teach, I teach at a university, so they're kind of young adults. And I teach performance poetry. And I've had to do it on Zoom this year. It was absolutely terrible. I, I mean, it worked because we had to do it to make it work for Zoom. But it wasn't like teaching in, in the class. And I really want to get back into the, in, in the classroom. But I've seen the stress on some of my students. I know in other universities and some schools actually where they've even been suicide with kids that can't cope. But in all the answers I've heard people saying, people keep talking about going back to normal. OK, I'm not going to be heavy, but normal got us here. You know, if you make a mistake, there's nothing wrong with making, mis making a mistake, but it's about making the mistake again and again and again. We've got to change the way we do things. I, I just think it seems obvious that nobody's saying it. Everybody's saying back to normal, back to normal. Normal got us here. What can I say? I mean, um, and I agree with you, you know, normal, you know, got us here, but we don't know factually, you know, what got us here. I think there's lots of speculation what got us here. And I agree with Madeline, we have to do with what we have now. We know where the coronavirus is. We know where they come now, from. Well, we're not, you know, I've not seen uh, the data that supports that. I'm not sure. The consensus seems to be that it was a a zoonotic disease that it came from. I have seen it somehow, under the microscope. But, but, no, it's not 100%. It's, it's, trust me, it's a wicked virus. If but, you could draw the evil virus to take over mankind, <laughs> that's what you'd draw. It's got claws on it to grab you. And this is the cartoon but, part. But my point is that I agree with Madeline in what she said, and we have to deal with what we have now. And, you know, the idea of schools one minute being open, a classroom being closed. And for you, imagine, you know, you go back in September and you're, you're teaching, you know, in person, and then the next week is on, it's on Zoom. For those of your students that can attend in Zoom, and many of them, you know, can't, and the pressure it puts on families. You know, I have three children, and every time, it, you, know, you know, one child gets sent home, I have to change my, my plan. The following week is another child, and then and then, and it continues. And the pressure it puts on families, you know, is immense. And so I think that knowing that this could be the case, and we have this situation now, and there are so many children suffering, it's what can we do to start from today okay. so that when children get sent home, there's a plan for them? Well, I think right. we can test, we'll but I don't think we have to we send home learn. whole bubbles. You know, we, we, we can test, and if an individual is found positive, we can send that individual home. I think we can do away with sending home whole bubbles. Because I've seen work. families where one person is infected and another person isn't. Think we are, there are things family. we could do to live better with it, aren't there? Because the school's point that Nicola made, we, we should be having daily testing of the contacts. There are about 400,000 kids at home who are just contacts of, of people who've tested positive. That, that's not sustainable. Yes. But the other thing I would just say, the cases have clearly been higher in some parts of the country all the way through the pandemic, and we've seen that in Greater Manchester. And yet we've not had policies that have recognised why, such as, supporting people with no access to sick pay to self-isolate if they are ill. And this is a point we've made all the way through the pandemic. Okay. The government has never dealt with it. You've got to deal with things like that. Also, put more of the booster supplies into the areas where the cases have been highest. Have a, 
an approach to the, to the pandemic that recognises okay. that health is poorest in some parts of the world. Me, let me hear a little bit from Owen before I go to another question. Uh, Tony. Yes, uh, Fiona, thank you again. I'm very privileged to work in a mass vaccination centre. Uh, three weeks ago, we were vaccinating people in their mid-30s. Two weeks ago, they were in the early 30s. Last week, we were vaccinating people in their 20s. At the same time, in Durham, where I live, there was a, a pop-up vaccination centre in the town centre for anybody over the age of 18. The vaccination programme is accelerating at a, a phenomenal rate, and I'm fairly confident, uh, and I think David might agree with this, that we will have everybody that needs to be vaccinated, vaccinated quite soon, very soon. And then come September, we'll be offering booster doses and for people yeah. over the age of 50, I believe, to start off with. So I'm anticipating that come September, I'm going to have a, a flu vaccine in one arm, a COVID in the other arm, and get on with it. And if I want to wear a mask, I'll wear a mask. Let people make these decisions. If you feel more comfortable wearing a mask, wear the mask. If you feel confident that you've been vaccinated and you may not catch the virus, well, get on with your lives, because that's what we really, really need to do. All right, let me take one more intervention from the audience before I move on. Andy. I think the key thing for me is if we want our lives back, if we want to have in-person studying and we want to have in-person socialising, we need to understand we can't go backwards. Um, we can't go back to how it was before. As, as you've already said, um, that's what got us here. So if I have to wear a mask to protect people that I want to interact with, because the mask doesn't protect me, it stops me from spitting all over someone else, I should do that the same way as I should drive my car and not smash into people. I should wear a mask to not give them a disease. And if that's what it takes to get the country back to normal, to get in-person teaching back to normal, to get small businesses, to get the hospitality industry, to get performing arts, to get everybody back to normal, if we wear a mask, that's not really a kind of big brother state. That's just me saying, and everybody saying, oh, I'm not actually going to spit all over you today. OK. <laughs> and on that charming thought, Andy, I'm going to take another question from, <laughs> from Fatima. Fatima Bula. Thank you, Fiona. Um, my question is, would a Labour defeat in Buckley and Spen today be the final nail in the coffin for the Labour Party? Andy. No, uh, absolutely not. I mean, you're going to say that, aren't you? Well, I am going to say that. I mean, the, the constituency is not what you might call a typical red wall seat where there's been a Labour majority for, forever. You know, this is a seat that is more marginal. It always, always Four has Four years been. ago, Tracy Braben won the party's highest ever vote and vote share in Buckley. No, sure, and so I, I was going to come on to say that it's, it, it's not that it wouldn't be serious. It would be uh, serious, and I think... You know, this is um, a real challenge, not just for Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, but the left more broadly. And I just want to make an important point about this, if I can, uh, Fiona, because we've lived through a decade now, a decade where quite wealthy and privileged people on the right of politics, or even the hard right of politics, have posed uh, as the friends of working class people. But what they've actually then been trying to do is divide working class communities, make them hate each other, one, one group to another. And that very much is kind of what I kind of see a sense of in, in Batley, uh, Batley and Spen. It's almost a sense of, you know, you're in a forgotten area and you should feel resentful about that because the minorities are, are taking everything. They're kind of selling this kind of, kind of narrative into, into these places. The reason why people are feeling their lives aren't good is because they've got right-wing governments that are allowing the cancer of zero-hours contracts to, to spread, that, you know, never take any regulation against private landlords who don't so maintain, their, maintain their properties. Why are they voting for this government? Are you suggesting they're just not quite as clever no, as you? I'm, no, I'm saying the left has failed to counter the narrative that's been, been, been built over the last decade. It's kind of divided people and it's made people fearful of each other. And I think what the Labour Party and the left more broadly around the world has got to do is kind of bring people back together again and say, look, there are policies that bind us all here. We all should be wanting a real living wage for everybody, wherever they come from, whatever community that they're in. We all should want, in my view, social care on NHS terms for everybody, Labour policies coming out of the, out of the pandemic. And I th one thing I just want to say, the place we should take inspiration, I think, is, is the current England team. You know, they 
Why have, is it that every, every politician is trying to attach their, well, just, attach there's a, there's to their nail their colour to that well, particular mark? Well, there's an important point because they've come under attack for taking the knee. Uh, and we've had Conservative MPs sort of uh, condemning the England team. Now, these are, this is the English working class, lads from all backgrounds, all, all colours. And actually, you know, the, the, the white members of the team have stood behind their teammates. And actually, they've, they've stood together. And I actually take inspiration from them, the, the next generation in this country, who I don't think see difference between people in the same way. I think we need to take inspiration from that. Bring working class people back together. Get policies that help lift everybody. A real version of levelling up. And I think the, the, the motto from the England team is if working class people stand together and fight together, they win together. And that is what the left has got to start doing and counter a kind of decade where some of the wealthiest people around have started to, to say to working class people, blame that person, your neighbour, who has a different colour skin from you for everything that's wrong with your life. That is what has been happening here and around the world, and we have got to mount a better response to it. Madeline. I don't think it's as simple as the, the Tory party have played divide and rule, and they've kind of effectively hoodwinked the working class into voting for them. I think that there is a real identity crisis um, for the Labour Party for, for many reasons. But, you know, there is a, a broad political realignment going on, and they've really struggled to find their place within that. Um, it often seems to me as if the party, in serious ways, is still very much stuck in the past. Um, you know, even the fact that at the time of great, the great decline of manual labour and, 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 uh, and so on, and yet there is still this disproportionate influence of the trade unions, which has led to some very left, probably more left wing than the general public would have liked leaders and uh, serious contenders in the Labour Party. But even the language sometimes sounds like it's from the 70s, saying things like, like comrades. Um, and I think, as Andy alluded to, and he himself is one of the, the very best people at doing this, but his colleagues are often struggling, um, there is a problem with articulating a way of being patriotic that feels genuine, because far too many Labour leaders attempt it, and it just it doesn't, it doesn't fit. Um, and in a way, I feel bad for Keir Starmer, because though there is a problem of him in uh, lacking charisma and sometimes struggling to get his message out um, to the general public, um, I think there is still some time to go before the party can move past the, the toxic legacy of Jeremy Corbyn, which is, isn't something that's going to go away overnight. So I think there's a, there was an existing identity crisis and a number of political problems. Uh, but you have to wonder, I mean, what, is the, what is the purpose of the Labour Party now if it, if it you know, no longer stands for, for the, the, the working classes? Benjamin? Would a Labour defeat in Bathley and Spain, because the by-elections today, be the final nail in the coffin for the party? Would it? Would you, and would you want Keir Starmer to go? Well, I think, no, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a big coffin and I think there's lots of other nails that can be hammered down. But, um, so I think, you know, that's a long way off. But I think it would signal, it, it would just be kind of uh, representative of the decline, if you like. But I think Andy said something really interesting about the Labour Party not, and the left generally, not being able to kind of be an effective opposition. And this is kind of happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. And actually, on the right wing as well, the Tory party, they're, they're not being good Tories anymore right, either. What do and, you mean by that? Well, you know, um, they're not kind of one nation Tories anymore. They, 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 they borrow left wing ideas when they need to. Furloughing is a kind of left wing thing you know, where the government steps in and helps people. I doubt if any modern Tory supporters read Adam Smith. Then again, I doubt if any left-wing people, many on the left, read Karl Marx. I'm probably the only anarchist you ever have on this programme. And I just don't believe in this central power that people want to go and grab all the time, because once they get it, they get very corrupted. And when you have a good person, and I'm not taking issue what you, with what was just said, but... Um, Jeremy Corbyn was really demonised. When you have somebody that really comes up and really cares about the working class people, he gets demonised in the press. When he's been interviewed, they ask him about his clothes, his tie, his glasses, all kinds of things that are not really relevant to politics because they just want to make him out to be an oddball character that's going to rob the wealth of their money. I think what we need to do... Funny enough, I think they need to do this on the, on the right as well. They, they really need to find a new way of dealing with politics. It's not just about calling people comrades. 
It's about this idea that the workers are going to put down the tools in the factory and go. They're not working in tools in factory, with tools in factories anymore. They're working behind computer screens. You know, um, not all Tory supporters are, are kind of working in the city and financial people. You know, politics has changed, and we've got to have new ideas coming forward on the left and the right um, to deal with the future. And I think some of the, if you talk about Marxism and capitalism and socialism and all those things, I think what's really going to work for us in the future is something we don't have a name for at the moment because we haven't worked it out. Chica? Um, you know, I, <clears throat> the professionals obviously, you know, have a, a, a quite a strong view here. And I would say, so I Did mean, you call me a professional? Yeah, all, all three of you. Um, <laughs> I'm a politician, though. <laughs> Hang on a minute. A I, um, I have a few friends, actually, and I've been a journalist for the past um, week and just, you know, and I have a view on how the election's gone. And call me Mystic Meg, if you will, um, and I will share that with you afterwards. But, you know, the people I've spoken to, <clears throat> a bit like Andy said, they they feel really forgotten and they feel let down and, um, you know, they feel the opportunities are not what they were. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, the, the numerous people I know that live in and around, um, you know, Yorkshire. Now, I think that... So would, would a Labour defeat yeah. be the final nail in the coffin for the I party? I think so, because, you know, more and more of them now are voting Conservative. Um, and sometimes the people, the you know, better the devil you know than the angel you don't. And currently, with the, with the um, party that they have now, and they've had the benefit of the furlough, they've had the benefit of, you know, getting support during this pandemic, um, and they've accessed it quite easily, you know, they don't feel listened to. So to go back to a government with, you know, where they haven't felt listened to, I think is going to be difficult. And if they do lose this election this time, you know, then it really will be very difficult, you know, for, for them to go back. And therefore, in that area, I think it could really be the end for them because more and more people are, are voting conservat um, conservative. David? You have two questions. Uh, if we win in Batley and Spen, which I think is quite likely, but we'll know in a, in a few hours, um, is it the end of Labour? No, it's not. I mean, I've seen both parties be on their uppers in, in the time I've been an adult, and, and then come back from it, you know, whether it's pre-Kinnock through to Blair or us with 100 seats in Parliament back to where we are now. So, no. Secondly, should they get rid of the Starmer? Well, it won't solve their civil war, which is their, their sort of recurrent serious problem at the moment, uh, where they can't really quite decide what they are. Uh, neither will it solve the problem they have. Now, Andy talked about, you know, the left has failed to counter the narrative. No. In the northeast of England and the north of England, uh, the, the, the left has failed to pr provide decent representation, as happened prior to that in Scotland, where you, you, your party was completely wiped out because they were so poor at doing their own job of representing the people uh, that they're elected by. And what I've seen, and we've both been to Batley, uh, what I saw in Batley is very similar to what I saw in the red, the red wall seats that I visited during 2019. A lot of people were very unhappy with a Labour Party they thought would put their taxes up. I mean, they, whether it's a demonisation of mm. Corbyn or not, that's, that's what they thought. A Labour Party they thought wasn't patriotic. Again, it may be demonisation, but that's, mm. that was a perception. Uh, and they do think that the, as it were, the Tory offer of levelling up is what they want. They feel neglected, not over 10 years, over 50 years. Over, you know, over my adult lifetime, they feel neglected. And frankly, I have some sympathy with them for that. Well, let me, Andy, let no. me ask you, because yep. um, you've spoken about this a number of times, and very recently there was an article that came out yesterday. You've said if there was a moment where it was right, I've indicated I'd be prepared to go back to Westminster. You've talked about your ambitions to lead the party. When will that moment look right? for you to get, try and get a seat at Westminster and go back and try and leave? Well, it's not now. I'll serve About a full second time. term as Mayor of Greater Manchester. No, I've made that so you'll commitment serve a full to people. Term. I will, and that, I want to make that absolutely uh, plain. And, you know, I, I want Keir to su su succeed. But I just want to pick up... I mean, I agree with David. The representation has not been what it should be in parts of the country, and that was one of the reasons we lost Scotland. But I'm also going to agree with Benjamin, because we do need a new way of doing things. And the new way of doing things is what... I'm building in Greater Manchester, what Steve Rotherham is building in Liverpool. This English devolution that we're building through the cities is place first rather than party first. It's a big change to the way politics is done. Westminster is party first. 
and I think people switch off from it. We come at it a different way, and actually, Benjamin, it's bottom up. We've had a drive in Greater Manchester to end homelessness, rough sleeping, and we've involved people from the uh, private sector, from the community and volunteer, the faith sector, and it's really empowering, and we've made a real change, and that is a different way of doing things. And also, I mean, I'm beginning to kind of roll back the 80s uh, a little. We're putting buses back under public control in Greater Manchester. We're building zero carbon homes for social rent, council housing. Okay, Hank, this isn't, this isn't a moment for you to kind of do no, your no, no, thinking about how marvellous you're doing but, in Manchester. We need to answer the question. But you know, I'm just saying, lastly, Fiona, uh, this sounds like bragging, so Well, it's, it all me, sounded like bragging for the last couple of minutes, if you don't mind me saying. the party dead? Well, can I say, am I allowed to say, that I won every single ward in Greater okay, Manchester? OK, that's, that's uh, <laughs> bragging too well, far. Let's hear from the audience. Party alive and well okay. to me. <laughs> There's quite a few people with their hands up there. Carlos. Hi, all. Um, I... Benjamin, this might be the first time you're not the only anarchist on the show. <laughs> <laughs> And I wanted to say that I agree with Andy. I do think it's the Conservative Party promoting division uh, amongst us, especially amongst the working class who seem to have lost that pride in being not... That's where the identity crisis is, because it's associated with being poor and not wanting to be seen as being poor. But unfortunately, the fact is that we still are. And the reason why the government, this Tory government, used lots of systems and ideas that were socialist in this case is because they're actually good ideas. Yes. Think okay. of the NHS and our care system, you know. So in an emergency, they've become, you know, absolutely important yeah. just because these are great ideas. Richard. Hey, thanks, Fiona. Um, Andy, I think you should stay on as um, the role that you're doing in Manchester. I, when I've heard direct first-hand compliments of the work that you did um, with regarding the bombings a few years ago, I never heard any compliments of anything that you did when you were in Parliament. They may well have been, but I never heard of them. The fantastic work that's going on at a local level like that is surely, surely the way that... Um, your party in particular, is going to come out of this. And you've already alluded to that. Why on earth would you want to go back into the main parliamentary uh, uh, well, establishment? Andy, we've don't. already heard that when works. the time is right, you do want to, and we're all, we'll all see Not that when it comes. Fatima. Soon. Yeah, I think um, if Labour can't hold this seat with this particular candidate that, that's standing, then I don't know about the final nail, but I think it's, it's a hard nail in the coffin. And I agree with Chico, it's going to be a really uphill struggle um, for the party to rally back. I know parties have peaks and troughs and come and go, but I think this time it's going to be really hard, especially coming so um, soon on the back of the loss in Hartlepool as well. It's going to be really difficult. And, and why do you think that's a possibility? That they might do why so do badly? Yeah, that they might do so badly. Why, why do I think they'll do so badly? I think, the, the Labour, if, I think if Labour hold the seat, it will purely be because of the... Um, local personality of the candidates, Joe Cox's sister, and, and that's, you know, really, really important. Um, but there's that particular area, that particular part of the world, it's not very far from where I am, there's a lot of discontent, there's a lot of disillusionment, there's been very little investment over many, many years, there's a lot of poverty, um, there's a lot of discord between communities, and like Andrew okay. was saying, and, yeah, but people are looking for something different. Um, and it's, 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 it's a shame that it's not going to be Labour, but um, I think it's well, going to be a real... Well, obviously, we don't, we don't know that yet, Fatima. We shall see. Know, we shall see in only a few hours' time. And I have to say, for the last time this side of the summer, our hour is up. Uh, thank Whoa. you very much. I know, Already? thank you very much to all of you. Already? <laughs> We're so enjoying ourselves. Thank you very much to the panel for coming tonight. Madeline, thank you so much for joining us down the line. To our QT50, I'm not sure if we'll see you on this in this format again. But I'm sure uh, as our audiences come to the various places where you do, we'll see you in real life. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this since January. So thank you for, you know, holding the flame, keeping the passion all this time. It's been really, really great hearing what you've had to say. And of course, to you at home. Thank you very much for watching. We'll be back in September. Until then, from Question Time, bye-bye.